Hello and welcome everyone to our final presentation on the series on ABG and its interpretation that is Stewart's approach. Acid-base balance was coined by Henderson in the early 20th century. Hasselbach introduced PCO2 into the Henderson's equation based on the carbonic acid giving it a logarithmic form. Sigard and Anderson proposed a PCO2 independent indicators for acid-base disturbances. So the traditional approach to acid-base interpretation is based on this formula that is pH is equal to pK plus logarithm of bicarbonate concentration divided by dissolved carbon dioxide. But please keep in mind while interpreting the blood gas report the bicarbonate that you see is actually calculated based on the formula rather than measured. The actual measured values are the hydrogen ion concentration and the PCO2. Now there has been a problem in finding the exact metabolic component in an acidosis. For respiratory acidosis it is easier because it is based only on the carbon dioxide but it has been quite problematic to do it for the metabolic component. To do that, the base excess concept was used. This meant that an acid or base that had to be added to a sample of whole blood in vitro to restore the pH of the sample to 7.4 while the PCO2 was held at 40 millimeters of mercury at a given hemoglobin concentration. The standard base excess is measured at 5 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. Now even though this gave some quantification to the metabolic component, the mechanisms for the me acid base disturbance especially for metabolic was still elusive. Next we looked at the concept of the anion gap. Well actually it is not a physiological reality but it's just an artifact of measurement. It is not something which actually exists in the body because we cannot have a difference in the charge inside the body. The, what the anion gap basically is, is that there are certain anions which are not being measured, especially the albumin and other things, which can produce a gap in the measurement. Now, what are the pitfalls of this traditional approach that we follow for acid-base interpretation. It cannot identify whether the acidosis is due to increased tissue acids, hyperchloremia or a combination of both. It cannot explain the acidosis and alkalosis due to derangement in albumin levels. And finally, as we already have seen this particular equation, we are not actually measuring the bicarbonate. So based on this, an alternative approach was put forth by Stewart. This was done in 1983. They produced this paper in which they had elaborately explained how can we give a modern interpretation to the acid-base chemistry. So this is basically based on three principles. The law of electroneutrality, which states that in an aqueous solution in any compound Component, the sum of all positive ions must be equal to all the negative ions. The law of mass action. This law dictates that the dissociation equilibrium of incompletely dissociated substances, especially the weak acids and the buffers. Finally, the law of conservation of mass. The amount of a substance remains constant unless it is added, removed, generated or destroyed. The total concentration is the sum of the concentration of the both dissociated as well as the undissociated form. So let's see who are the major players in this particular interpretation. Here we see what is the most important player quite correctly because it is almost 60 to 70 percent of our body. The next are strong ions, especially the cations, followed by the anions, and finally the weak acids. As you can see over here, the hydrogen ion concentration is almost 10 to the power 9 times less than that of strong ions. But yet somehow to believe that it is the hydrogen ions which are controlling the internal milieu is I think 
not explaining the actual chemistry that is going on inside the body. This is a similar diagram showing the same thing almost. Here we can see that the water which is the main component of this particular theory followed by the sodium and chloride and as we can see the hydrogen ion which is very very less and its concentration is very minimal compared to these two important structures. So let's see how the theory is put forth. So the most important part in the hydrogen ion generation or the in contribution to the pH is the dissociation of water. At equilibrium, if we apply the law of mass action, it's constant into the water which is equal to the hydrogen ion concentration multiplied by the hydroxyl ion concentration. So the multiplication of the hydrogen into the hydroxyl ion concentration gives us a constant. At 25 degrees centigrade, the dissociation constant of water gives a pH of 7. So the conception that the normal pH is 7 is a misconception. It is based on the temperature. At 25 degrees centigrade, it, the pH of 7 is neutral. Pure water is always acid based neutral, but pH 7 is not necessarily the neutral point. But its hydrogen and concentration varies considerably with temperature. For example, at 0 degree centigrade, the pH which is neutral is 7.5, while at 100 degrees it is 6.1, while at a body temperature that is which is commonly present inside the human body, the neutral pH is 6.8. The next is the law of electrical neutrality. It means that the electrical neutrality has to be maintained inside a solution. If only sodium and chloride are present, then this is how it works. Now, if there is a increase in the cation level, for example, if there is an increase in the sodium level, then this increased sodium will get attached to the hydroxyl ion because water is the most common chemical present inside the body. Now, if this hydroxyl ion is getting utilized for the sodium, then the dissociation of the hydrogen will be reduced, which means that the water's dissociation will be reduced and you will have lesser hydrogen ions present inside the body, resulting in an increase in pH. Similarly, the opposite happens if there is an increase in the chloride level. This chloride level will attach to the hydrogen and thereby increasing the level of hydrogen, resulting in a decrease in the pH. The next are the strong ions. An acid or base is defined as strong if it exists in a fully dissociated form. So strong ions are basically those chemicals which get completely dissociated in a solution like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, sulfate. So the most common strong ions are these only. And the strong ion difference is sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium minus chloride plus lactate. The next are the weak ions. These are the acids and bases which are partially dissociated in a range of body pH. The common weak ions are albumin and phosphate. Now, Stewart identified three principal mathematically independent determinants for the acid in the body. That is the carbon dioxide, the electrolytes, the strong ion difference and the weak acids. So, the formula is the strong ion difference minus carbon dioxide plus the acid gives us zero. So, if there is a change in this equation, we will have some acidosis or alkalosis. So, if there is an increase in carbon dioxide, there is acidosis. If there is a decrease in the SID, it will result in acidosis. Similarly, an increase in the albumin or phosphate, which will increase the weak ion concentration, will cause acidosis. The opposite effects will result in alkalosis. Now, physiological mechanisms which control the strong ion difference. Kidney is the primary organ that changes the relative concentration of strong ions and cations. Now the acid handling by the kidney is mediated through chloride balance. Please note the hydrogen excretion is irrelevant because 
water provides us with almost infinite source of hydrogen ions. However, the ammonium is important to systemic acid-base balance. But note, it is not for the excretion of the hydrogen ion, but rather for the excretion of the chloride ion. It is the excretion of this chloride ion which is actually reducing the acidosis or the pH in the body. So, what are the equations? These are the six equations which define the Stewart's principle and which help us in finally noting how, what is the effect on the blood pH. But why can't we still use it is because the, these measurements, these concentrations that are to be measured are not yet accurately measured and not just that it is not something which we can do it at the bedside like we can do the traditional methods the advantage of our traditional method is it is something which we can do at the bedside and get an immediate result but to do these equations of the Stewart principle it takes time and it is still the accuracy of the measurements isn't adequate enough and finally it is not something which we are able to do at the bedside yet so how does it matter why are we even discussing it if we are to use the traditional approach well even though we cannot yet use it at the bedside and the traditional approach is something which is still going on and does most of our analysis and really doesn't change the treatment much but the use of the Stewart's principle does help us think differently about the fluids at least the ones which we are using right now the IV fluid mixture equilibrate with the extracellular fluid and thus they alter the strong ion difference and the A dot. The carbon dioxide total of the infused fluid does not affect the extracellular SID or A dot. So the concept that we have is the bicarbonate in the soda bicarbonate is not treating our metabolic acidosis. Rather it is the strong ion difference that is the increased sodium present in the sodium bicarbonate which is actually reducing the metabolic acidosis. Now the fact that giving both the normal saline as well as dextrose results in a acidifying effect it is explained by this principle because finally if we do our calculation we find that the strong ion difference is reduced. It is this reduction in the strong ion difference which has an acidifying effect on the body. Now the Hartman solution, it has a lower strong ion difference than the plasma but it is greater than zero which will drop the plasma strong ion difference just enough to counteract the ATOT dilutional alkalosis caused by the albumin free fluid that we are giving. So it is almost a physiological solution you can say. Now in states of hypovolemia associated with loss of free water, although the total concentration of ion remains unchanged, the SID increases as the sodium increases more than the chloride. Now this is actually the basis of the contraction alkalosis that we see. Again, hypokalemia and alkalosis is also explained by this principle. Now coming to blood that we transfuse. At collection, the blood is mixed with preservatives, usually the citrate with small amounts of phosphate. Now the accompanying sodium cation adds approximately 40 millimoles per liter to the effective SID of the blood unit. For this reason, it is not surprising that large volume of blood transfusion results in alkalosis because the citrate will be metabolized by the body leaving the sodium. Now the chloride to sodium ratio is a very very important determinant of acid base balance. The chloride to sodium ratio serves as substitute to quantify the role of hyperchloremia in acid base disturbances. Now if we note frusemide causes greater renal loss of chloride than sodium leading to low chloride to sodium ratio increasing the SID. This is the reason why Lasik's use results in a metabolic alkalosis. Now, the various effects of the current concept of using balanced salt solution, trying to get our SID correct. This has been reviewed by Dr. Samir Samal and this review article focuses on how the use of balanced salt solution has affected treatment in OT, in transplant and in critical care units. 
so thank you for your patience and this was our final presentation next the classes will start on fluid and electrolyte balance thank you for your patience and check our website for further information